Hey everyone. Well, it is Super Bowl Sunday, so I'm going to try to be quick so we can get done with this and get to the game. Just kidding. But seriously, we have a lot of content to get through today. You know, that's the thing about going verse by verse through the book of Daniel. The chapters in Daniel are really long, so we really do have to jump right in. So today we're going to start chapter four. Just a reminder, chapter one, Daniel and his friends are brought to Babylon. Chapter two, Daniel interprets King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Chapter three, the three friends get thrown into the fire but are supernaturally saved by God. And chapter four begins possibly 30 years after the fiery furnace incident. Verse one says this, King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. This chapter is King Nebuchadnezzar's letter to the entire world. He believes everyone needs to hear this story. And before we continue, I want to make sure that we understand that this is for us too. Romans 15.4 says, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Everything in the Bible is for us including this letter from a Babylonian king. And as Paul tells us, if we will listen, it can bring us hope. So let's pay attention. Verse 2 goes on, It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. When Janelle and I were first dating, I remember showing her a VHS tape. You remember those? Uh, of me street racing. You know, back in the day, I was really into modifying Hondas. This is what my car looked like. I really missed that car. It was a 1997 Honda Civic hatchback. And those rims on that car, they are an SSR Type M's. That might mean nothing to you, but they were super rare and really lightweight. They only weighed 11 pounds, which is good for racing. And you can't really see it in the picture, but there's also a carbon fiber hood on it. I am still convinced that I was the first person in San Diego to have one. But what you can't see is the motor under that hood. I had swapped out the motor for a much faster one. And this thing could fly. I never officially timed it, but I was beating cars that were running high 13 second quarter miles. Anyways, I'm showing Janelle these videos and she's pretending to be interested because we had just started dating. But there was one part that stood out. If I'm remembering correctly, the video was taken from the inside of the car. And so it's looking through the front windshield. It was me and another person talking. And I'm in line waiting to race. And there's this voice that is dropping four-letter words just left and right. Like, bleep, 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 bleep. And Janelle looks over and says, who is talking? And I say, oh, that's me. And she looked over in disbelief and was like, no way. You see, when Janelle and I met, I had just started following Jesus. I was still new and maybe a few months in, but Jesus had changed my life. Even to the point where the idea of me cussing was foreign to anyone who had met the new me because I was radically different. And as I read the first few verses of chapter 4, I feel the same way about the king. Something is different about Nebuchadnezzar. He's not just praising God at the end of the chapter like he's done before. He, he's starting with praise, and he seems genuine. So what happened? Well, he's about to tell us. Verse 4, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. I saw a dream that made me afraid. As I lay in my bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. One thing that has happened is he's had another dream. But don't miss what he writes before that because I believe it's there for a reason. He says that he was at ease and prospering. You know, this story happened 2,000 years ago on the other side of the world, but things haven't changed much. Like today, there was a high value on comfort and success. Now, don't get me wrong. Comfort is not bad, and neither is success. God gives both. Where they become a problem is when they are prioritized over God. 
And he loves us way too much to let us live this way. And so what he will do is he will warn us. And for the king, that warning came in the form of another dream. But this also makes me think of this. God is always speaking. Sometimes he chooses to use dreams and sometimes not. Regardless of how he chooses to speak, the question is, are we listening? I said a couple of weeks ago that Nebuchadnezzar has problems, but I do have to give him credit here. He also listens. But can we say the same about ourselves? Are we listening? Do you come to church on Sundays? Do you log on to church online and then tune out? Or are you so distracted, even if God was speaking right now, you wouldn't hear him? Let's take a lesson from this pagan king. Today, listen for what God might be speaking. Additionally, take time to understand his message, because that's what the king does next. Verse 6, so I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me, that they may make known to me the interpretation of the dream. The magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers came in, and I told them the dream, but they could not make known to me its interpretation. You know, this time he doesn't ask for both the dream and the interpretation, but it makes no difference. They still couldn't help him. Verse 8, at last Daniel came in before me, he who was named Belteshazzar after the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And I told him the dream. Let's pause for a second. I find it interesting that Nebuchadnezzar uses both the Hebrew and the Babylonian name for Daniel. I'm not completely sure why, but my guess is it has to do with how Nebuchadnezzar is now different. You know, when the story happens, Nebuchadnezzar refers to Daniel as Belteshazzar, which gave honor to the Babylonian god. But now, as he's telling the story, he's different. And he calls him Daniel, which means God, the God of Israel, is my judge. I think this tells us that the king was once one way, but now he is different. And his words show this. Also, maybe some of us are a little put off by Nebuchadnezzar saying, Daniel, uh, the one who has the spirit of the holy gods. And we hear that. We're like, wait, what, what do you mean holy gods as in plural? That's not theologically accurate. That's true. But remember, the king is telling a story about something that happened in his past. But he's different now. But that doesn't change what he said before. And before, he was a polytheist. Also, the translation is difficult. And it is possible to translate it, spirit of the holy God, if that makes you feel any better. Verse 9. O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and that no mystery is too difficult for you, tell me the visions of my dream that I saw and their interpretations. The visions of my head as I lay in bed were these. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great and the tree grew and became strong and its top reached to the heaven and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it and the birds of the heavens lived in its branches and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. Just FYI, the holy one or this watcher is simply an angel. Verse 14, he proclaimed aloud and said, chop down this tree and lop off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but leave the stump of its root in the earth and bound it with a band of iron and bronze amid the tender grass of the field. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's and let a beast's mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones to the end that the living may know that the most high rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he wills and sets over it the lowliest of men. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, saw. And you, O Belteshazzar, 
Tell me the interpretation. Because all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able for the spirit of the holy gods is in you. That was the king's dream. And now here's Daniel's response. Verse 19. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was dismayed for a while and his thoughts alarmed him. The king answered and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation alarm you. Belteshazzar answered and said, My Lord, may the dream be for those who hate you and its interpretation for your enemies. What an interesting response from Daniel. It almost seems like Daniel cares for the king. This man who is responsible for destroying his home, the man who tried to burn his friends alive, the reason Daniel hasn't seen Jerusalem in decades. Is he just giving the king an insincere response? Possibly, but I personally believe it's something else. The prophet Jeremiah had a message for God's people in Babylon. He said this, This is what the Lord of heaven's army, the God of Israel, says to all the captives he has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food they produce. Marry and have children. Then find spouses for them so that they may have many grandchildren. Multiply. Do not dwindle away and work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. In a sense, Jeremiah was telling them to be a blessing in Babylon to be a light in the darkness, to remember their purpose as a people. You know, God had told Abraham, that is the father of the Jewish people, he said, go from your country, your kindred, and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse, and in you... All the families of the earth shall be blessed. Israel was supposed to be a people that pointed the world to the one true God. They failed at doing that, which is part of the reason why they are now exiled. But the mission doesn't change. And in Babylon, they were to continue being a blessing to all the families of the earth. But we got to ask, why? I think Jesus gives us an answer. You know this verse, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Why be a blessing to the nations? Why pray for Babylon? Because God loves the whole world. Why does Daniel speak kindly to the king? Because Daniel loves the king. Because God loves the king. And Daniel shares God's heart. Do we do this? Do we share God's heart for all people? Or do we pick and choose who is worthy of our love? People ask Janelle and I, why in the world would you move from San Diego to Glastonbury? It's probably the question we get asked the most. And they also ask, why do you love living here? We are trying to get out of this place. Why do I love Glastonbury? Why do I love a community where I know there are a bunch of people who do not believe or do not agree with what I believe here? I love Glastonbury because God loves Glastonbury. Acts 17 says, From one man he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. My friends, if you follow Jesus and live here in New England, whether you like it or not, we are called, we, there's a reason why we are here. We are called to love the people of this community. That's the reason why God placed us here. It's not for our ease, not for our prosperity. It's so that our neighbors would seek after God and find him, ideally because we have been a blessing to them. Daniel continues with the interpretation 
Verse 20, the tree you saw, which grew and became strong, so that its top reached to heaven. And it was visible to the end of the whole earth, whose leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field found shade, and whose branches the birds of the heavens lived in. It is you, O king, who have grown and become strong. Your greatness has grown and, and reaches to the heaven and your dominion to the ends of the earth. And because the king saw a watcher, a holy one coming down from heaven, saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field, and let him be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. It is a decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the King, that you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven, and seven periods of time shall pass over you till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. You know, that last sentence is repeated multiple times in this chapter meaning it's important. And all of this is happening so that Nebuchadnezzar would know this very important thing, that he would know that the Most High rules. In other words, that he would know the Lord. Isn't that fitting for us too? Our 2024 vision or what we're focusing on this year as a church is that Jesus is Lord. And today God's word sits before us as it did Nebuchadnezzar so that we too may know that Jesus is Lord, that he rules. But are we listening? Verse 26, And as it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be confirmed for you from the time that you know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may be perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. Daniel tells the king, you, you have a choice. God is warning you ahead of time because he loves you. Turn from your sin. Do what is right so that you can continue to live in God's blessing. And again, is this word for us too? I think so. Is God warning us today? Do we need to break off our sins and practice righteousness? What's happening in your life right now that needs to change? Maybe you've continued to ignore God's command to seek his kingdom first because you would rather seek ease and prosperity. Maybe you continue to practice sin, even in secret, and nothing's happened so far. You've never been caught, so you think that you're getting away with it. But let me tell you, you're not. And God sees it, but he's just being patient with you, hoping that you would turn from it. Maybe you don't share God's heart and continue to be unwilling to love and forgive people. But now, this warning, God's word sits before us. And we have a choice too. How will we respond? How did the king respond? Verse 28, all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar at the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal pa palace of Babylon. And the king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? You know what? The king, he responds like we, like we would. Even when we hear God speak, what, what do we do? We don't obey. You know, one of my favorite Bible stories is the Christmas story out of Luke 2. I love it because when the gospel comes to the shepherds who represent the lowliest of people, it reveals that the gospel is for everyone. But I believe that this story preaches the same message, but just in reverse. In one sense, the king is unlike any of us. One Bible commentator mentions that he may have been the most powerful ruler ever. You know, currently we live in the most powerful nation here in America. But even our president, the one who is in charge, has limits and checks to, to his, his power. But Nebuchadnezzar had none. What he decreed was final. So there was no one like him. And yet, at the same time, he is 
just like us. We too hear God's word and his warnings and we ignore them just like the king. And so you know what? The king's story matters to us because it's our story too. Verse 31, and while the words were still in the king's mouth. There fell a voice from heaven. O oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of this field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers, and his nails were like bird claws. Two things for us to consider. Number one, God always fulfills his word. What he says will happen will happen. And this should encourage us to obey him. Secondly, in a way, what we see happen to Nebuchadnezzar is a result of God's grace being withdrawn from his life. In the Bible says that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. Jesus said that God provides the sun and the rain to all people. Furthermore, all humans have God's image stamped on them. Therefore, any expression of of goodness experienced is sourced from God, whether the recipient knows it or not. That being said, do you know what happens when God removes himself from the picture? All the goodness goes away, and humans become nothing more than beasts. Do we not see glimpses of this truth in our world today? As we have removed God from every space, haven't the atrocities grown? Romans 1 says, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They were full of envy and murder and strife and deceit and maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, Ruthless. Without God, we are nothing but ruthless animals. And Nebuchadnezzar personally experienced this. And unfortunately, our culture seems to be headed down the same path. But the story isn't over yet. There is still hope. Verse 34. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? It took seven years, but the king finally repented. He surrendered to the Lord. Verse 36, at the same time, my reason returned to me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my Lord sought me. And I was established in my kingdom. And still more greatness was added to me. God restored all things and more to Nebuchadnezzar. And today, some of us need to hear this. God is not out to destroy you. He loves you, but he loves you too much to let you destroy yourself. So he will do whatever he needs to, even taking every temporary thing away from you so that one day you could find eternal life in him. Whatever situation you're in, just remember this that there is still hope if you will surrender to the Lord like Nebuchadnezzar did. The king finishes his letter with this. He says, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven for all his works are right and his ways are just and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. It's interesting. I think many Christians are hesitant to say Nebuchadnezzar was transformed by God's grace. And I understand why. His life is messy. 
But again, aren't we all? I actually think that his spiritually messy journey adds to the authenticity because it looks like my journey. It looks like your journey. And it preaches the gospel. It reminds us that eternal life isn't earned by perfection, but rather by trusting in Jesus who saves us even when we are without hope, even we, when we are at our lowest point. He is the one who saves us. And so as we begin to close, here's what I'd like for us to understand. Number one, no matter where you are today, you can choose to surrender to the Lord and he will save you. Number two, lay down your pride. Pride can be defined as, as, as it can be, defined this, can be defined this way. It's like saying, I am Lord rather than Jesus is Lord. Wasn't that how Nebuchadnezzar initially responded? And it's what we do too. We say, I get to pick how I live. I get to pick who I love and who I like. But remember the king's powerful words. For those who walk in pride, God is able to humble. Humility is a great teacher, but the lessons are hard. And yet, we can choose to skip those lessons if we are just willing to surrender by faith. And so, we can be humble or we can be humbled. How will you respond today? As we close, wherever you are, here's the next step that I believe can help all of us. In verse 34, the king said, I lifted my eyes to heaven. God is speaking to us, and his message is clear. It's know me as Lord. And the way that we do that is simple. We lift our eyes to heaven, look up to Jesus, surrender, cry out for help, and he will save you. Let's pray. Jesus, today we set our eyes upon you. We know that you are in control. We know that you can do whatever you want, and whatever you want to do is good. And so we trust you. We have listened to your word today, and we are ready to obey Show us our next step and give us faith to walk towards you, even if it requires us to be humbled. In Jesus' name, amen.